This weekend I am swapping my troop carrier for a vehicle that I've been excited about driving for well over a year. When INEOS announced Grenadier and said what it was going to be, I got very, very excited. And despite INEOS Australia's obvious reluctance to loan me one for a review, I called upon my fans and I had two responses. Yes, Andrew, I've got a Grenadier, I'm in WA, would you like to loan it for the weekend for a review? So that is about to be swapped for a Grenadier for the weekend. They did not muck about when they designed this car. I'm Andrew St. Pierre White, explorer, overlander and broadcaster with over 40 years driving 4x4s in association with the Overland I'm Workshop. As I am sitting down to edit this, I realise now that this is going to be a long, in-depth review and I will index each section of this review so you can jump ahead and back as you please. Now, it's pinging at me. I quickly learnt that this is a software upgrade currently promised by INEOS got an orange. and in this case it was actually a parking sensor that appeared to be confusing the bull bar with somebody or a car in front of the INEOS. But I quickly got used to them pinging sounds and could get on with my first impressions. My first impressions are that the steering is how do I put this, how, how do I go easy on the car? Because I have to tell you, my first impressions are, it's fantastic. I have to say that, because it feels like a G-Wagon. It is built like a G-Wagon, which means it is solid. Everything about it, you close and open the doors to go down there you open and close the doors you, you everything about it is like g-wagon except for the steering we'll get back to the steering in a minute because question of course about the steering is can one get would one one get used to the steering all right that's you've got to put play that because no car's perfect and this thing as a top heavy four wheel drive ladder frame chassis solid axles it's good i've only driven it on, on on road but okay there are my first impressions ineos has tried to explain away the Grenadier's lack of steering feel, saying they put in a, what, what basically it's a worm and nut uh, steering box because it reduces or nearly eliminates steering kickback. That kind of thing really bugs me. It is just, it's bullshit. No vehicle of this kind is going to have what's known as a rack and pinion steering, which you would find in a... Uh, what's this car coming along here? It's a, it's a little Nissan Qashqai or whatever it is. It'll have rack and pinion steering, okay? Rack and pinion steering, very tight. You get lots of feedback. As a driver, you get feel of the steering wheel. You, 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 but not great for off-road vehicles because if you do hit uneven ground, you tend to get a lot of feedback and in an off-road vehicle you don't want that feedback so that INEOS are not wrong but saying that is as a, an excuse is pure bullshit that kind of steering is used was used in the earliest Land Cruisers the earliest Land Rovers my it's 1970 designed Range Rover has got it in Gelenderwagen they've all got it it's old school which is good but the fact that cars like 80 series Land Cruiser an 80 series Land Cruiser is has got far superior steering to this different level they have made a bold claim in their sales brochure precise steering it is the exact opposite of precise steering 
I'm going to give you a demonstration now of the steering. It's self-centering sucks. All right, watch this. Now I'm going to do a U-turn now. Okay, U-turn all the way over and release the steering wheel. So it does correct. Not fast, mind you. It's just a bit slow. It's a bit dim-witted is the truth. Land Cruiser 70 series. Fair comparison. Ladder frame chassis, solid axles front and back. This one has the disadvantage of leaf springs in the back instead of coils. Let's see how well this does. At 20 kilometers an hour I'm going to give it a U-turn and I'm going to let the steering wheel go. Perfect. This is the tires on this are the recommended most common size supplied with 70 series. This is a long shot. 1975 Range Rover, again ladder frame chassis, solid axles front and back, but I have one major disadvantage. This car has no power steering. Let's see if it's like a comparison. About the same speed, 20 k's an hour. I'm going to do a U-turn and I'm going to let the steering go. Unbelievable. Not how good this is. It's unbelievable how bad the Grenadier is. It's not even as good as a 47 year old Range Rover without power steering. It's the only thing so far I've actually found that I and, and the lump that I that I really don't like about it. It's the only thing. But the best part about this car, without question for me, is the fact that you guys in North America, who are whoops, wrong button, uh, North America, are deprived of some really great cars. I mean, if you think about 70 series, you don't get 70 series. You don't get 70 series in most of Europe. And the 70 is a wonderful machine. Okay, I pressed that the wrong button. Let's try that. The 70 series for the four-wheel drive enthusiast is unequaled. It's brilliant. Well, you know, I'm biased, particularly the troop carrier. And you don't get them there. You do get this and all of its different model shapes the hard body and the quartermaster pickup and the fact that in Europe and North America you don't have to put up with this lump in the floor it's not going to worry a passenger when we talk about Genesis the Genesis of the Grenadiers idea it's this car it was the first car in the world with the idea that you could have a heavy duty four-wheel drive ladder frame, solid axles, but it could also be comfortable and hugely versatile. This is the ver this was the first car in the world like it. And you could say, well, there was the Jeep, uh, Grand, the, the Wagoneer. Yeah, but that had, that was incredibly uncomfortable. It had leaf springs all around. It was not a patch on Range Rover when it came to comfort but the Range Rover was the first one that actually became a bit of a fashion statement it became desirable and that really is I mean four-wheel drive vehicles now have been for 30 40 years desirable why let's go I I think we I think I'm I think I'm losing track here let's get back to subject at hand all right, I look at this switch gear at the top here and I have to say it's beautifully done. It, the quality of the switching, the quality of the print, the practically though, I can't read any of those. I need to get my reading glasses and I kind of have to angle my head underneath and squint to see what they are. But remember, if it's your vehicle and you get to know it, you'll eventually know where all the switches are. You could almost be able to do it without looking up. So that is, that's okay. It's the fact that you can't really read them 
is okay. The fact that you can put the vehicle in various off-road modes to turn off potentially annoying things and you have the differential lockers front and back it will only lock the front once the back is locked that is for safety nothing unusual about that but very important for safety the B pillar is a little close to me it's a remnant of the old Land Rover Defender it's a little bit far forward than I would like it to be and farther forward than it is on a 70 series not by a lot but by some it has nice uh, places to put your arms 70 series has nowhere to put your arms but it does have somewhere to put your left foot so the lump in the transmission next to the transmission in right hand steering models is a big question mark was that in the steering the steering I have settled it's not great in fact I think it's actually quite poor but I think it's something that one can learn to live with is that lump something I can learn to live with I will only know when I've done my it's a two-hour trip up the coast on the beach some dune driving and two hours back and I will be able to then tell you whether I think that is something that could potentially be a deal breaker I know for a fact that it is a deal breaker I know somebody I know very well a friend personal friend was very interested in a Grenadier and decided on Land Cruiser 200 he took this for a test drive took a two, the 300 rather Land Cruiser for a test drive and settled on the Land Cruiser and when I asked him why he said that lump in the floor forget it so that's one sale you've lost there are probably more because of that lump somebody when developing this vehicle said uh, it'll be all right okay even if I don't find it annoying guys it's not all right there's a part of me as a lover of things four-wheel drive I I love this thing already already I've done nothing with it and I love it honestly didn't think this would happen more tomorrow two hours north of my home very nice to drive on the open road responsive handles fast curves very well for such a large and heavy vehicle but now it's time to take it into some rough stuff right going off road park low I'm going to stay in high but I'm going to lock the center locker that's east is off-road off it look yes there you go sensor it's giving me everything and it's warning me that my tire pressures are low yes they are low right it's weekend so it's going to be a little bit busy I've traveled about two hours north of where I live to a place called Wanagarin National Park. It allowed me to drive off-road soft sands, dune, dune climbs and drops. And there are some quite gnarly tracks in the area as well. I've invited my friend Heiner Klarman, who is driving his heavily modified Land Cruiser 76 station wagon, mainly for support should I need it. a lot of power that actually took me by surprise the response was instant on the accelerator I expected it to go and it punched Knowing that I had a rescue vehicle close at hand gave me a little bit of Dutch courage. Right. <laughs> I was asking a lot of it. All right, I uh, need to go in reverse. There you go. I just got to get used to it.
it does feel heavy. It, 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 it's not a light car. It's not. But I'm asking it to do extreme stuff and it's got so much low down grunt. Really, really impressive. But driving in dunes in the middle of the day, you don't have any shadows, so you can't actually see the, the, the drop-offs. It's very good. It's very, very good. I thought for a moment there that you were going to have to rescue me. But it's fine. It looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> Now, I'm going to do exactly the same with the 76. Granted, the 76 is not standard. It has obviously very large wheels. Uh, those are about 31 inch. These are 33s and manual gearbox, etc. But just to get a, a feel of it, so I can just give you an idea of just because in Australia, of course, it's a choice. Do we go do we Ineos or we go with the old trusted Toyota? Uh, all right, let's do this. And this has obviously got a pretty heavy load on the on the roof. I'm using first gear high range. Oh, the 76 is finding it easier but it's it's not really a fair comparison to be honest with you because this is going be a highly modified car if it was unmodified with the same size wheels the difference would only be noticed by the skill of the driver would make the difference not the car because the Ineos is, is uh, performs beautifully very impressive So what do you think? You're out there looking at it. What do you think? The 76 sounds a lot cooler. It sounds a lot cooler and it actually is, it drives a lot easier. It does? Yeah. It is a lot yeah. heavier, but it's also a lot more modified. Than uh, it's a lot more modified. That's a stock car. So you, it's not a fair comparison. And I'm more used to this. I knew exactly what was happening. That's new. So not a fair comparison, but what the hell? We're having fun as well as playing with but they both look good, car. to be honest. The, the Grenadier looked like it was easy too. It did not struggle at all. It's not struggling. It's not struggling. No, it's not. And it looks... I love the look of it. It has a certain... Uh, that, you know, we were thinking of talking about what the car is and what it looks like. There's, it's a bit Hummerish here. It's a bit G-Wagon here, and it's obviously the Defender silhouette here. If that's what you were going for, guys, you did a very good job. What I've enjoyed a lot about the Ineos is that there's a feeling of confidence in the car. You know, in a four-wheel drive, you, you, you get that feeling of confidence after you've owned it a while, after you've taken it off-road, after you've become familiar with it, after it becomes just kind of you and the car become tight that's happened very fast with this car i just have confidence in it but it is but it is heavy but i do feel as if it's heavy it feels like my fully laden true carrier and in fact the ride is I, full marks to the guys that did the suspension layout of this i know it was a balance of load carrying axle articulation roll and handling the control of roll and handling on on fast asphalt it's a difficult balance it's very it's a very g-wagon like balance that you've got here i would say i would venture a guess 
and I can't help comparing it more often with the G-Wagons that I've owned than with the Defender that I've owned. I used to say that the G-Wagon was built as if it was honed out of a single block of whatever. That there were no joints, no bolts, no nuts. It had that solid feel about it. That is definitely not the feel one gets from a traditional Defender. The opposite is actually the case. But with the G-Wagon, it is. And that's why I keep finding myself jumping back into the driver's seat of my 290 GD. Now that I've established how good the Grenadier feels, it's time now to look at some of the detail. So we're going to drive down the beach a bit and try and find some shelter from this infernal wind and sand that's blowing in our faces. Let's have a look at the outside. But so far it's scoring on all of the important stuff. And I think the same is going to happen on the outside. For example, on first appearance it has a very good approach angle, but when you look at it a little bit closer it's not as good as it looks. And it's because of this. This is a good solid protective plate and it's just as well because right behind it is a radiator and this mesh here is uh, well it's already loose and I'm just pushing it with my with my finger. That is vulnerable. This being a trailmaster means it has a winch and it is plastic but it's pretty robust I think it'll be okay and now I have access to the winch. Because of limited amount of space I believe there's only 12 meters of winch cable which is a bit short but easily fixed by carrying a winch extension cable. What do you think of the bull bar? I think it sets off the lines very very nicely and it's a properly nice bull bar. This of course is not a snorkel but a raised air intake and it is a little bit noisy. It's kind of kind of whistles a bit. Not overly noisy, but I can hear it at times. They have put load rails on the door. Now I'm not sure how I could use that. How useful is that? I mean it looks nice, and these are the kind of kind of load rails that are very common in common use. Uh, but what would I what would you use them for? I'm not sure. I mean do you really want something attached to the door that you're opening and closing and uh, I'm not sure. Here though at the back this definitely is a useful place. I imagine you could have some jerry can brackets uh, strapped to here or, or, or that, that is really useful. All right but check this out and this here. Now if I lift that that is a Deutsch plug. That is a properly good connection. Wired to the interior switches. So you could put uh, a light up here. What else could you put up here? I can't think of anything else other than a light, but I'm sure somebody will come up with some other ideas. But there's one there, one there, and two on the other side as well. Brilliant. I love that kind of stuff. Every manufacturer that does something in the middle of the wheel, it's ugly. Recovery equipment. Brilliant. In fact, I wonder if they'll sell me one of these to put on the back of my Land Cruiser because I just want to put this on the back of my Land Cruiser. What a brilliant idea and it's lockable. Okay, double doors. Now, I want to talk about double doors. I wonder why you did a double door. I question it because I know a lot of four-wheel drives do have a double door and the reason why they have a double door is because it was a specification from the UN. NGO vehicles have double doors. Land Cruisers had them, Nissan Patrols had them, even the G-Wagon had them. And uh, they weren't quite the same as this, but they were similar. Is it because you've got a spare wheel and the door here, if it wasn't a double door, would be absolutely huge. So perhaps it was an engineering thing. Because to be honest, the second door here, can you hear that? the way that closes and opens? Doors that solid are a rarity with, car, with any kind of car. Beautiful. It's quite 
narrow. There's, there's, I can get some stuff in and out of it, but I wonder why the bulge here, which has made it considerably narrower, is it because you moved the wheel over here because of the tail lights? Because remember, a lot of four wheel drives have the tail lights in the bumper. This one doesn't have that, they're here, which means you had to move the wheel this way to clear that light, which meant it would interfere with the tow bar, which meant you had to lift it up, which means it blocks the rear view a bit. I'm just making these comments because I'm just, I'm just questioning. You know, this vehicle was built from scratch really recently by people dedicated to building an off-road vehicle. So I pose these questions and I'm making certain conclusions. I'm wrong, but those are my conclusions. There's nothing wrong with this big door. They have put a gas strut on it, which is what I would wish they would do with a Land Cruiser, because my doors, if it's a little bit of a slope, they tend to close. It's not really annoying, but occasionally it is. Well, yes, fantastic. Again, in here, storage for first aid kits, emergency kits, tools, and things like that. This is a good impact absorbing plastic plastic rubber uh, lots of tie downs they're flush yes they're flush now here look at this chocks and a i don't want to break it it's not my car there's a jack in there hydraulic a squat hydraulic jack in there all nicely finished Nicely finished. Nicely thought out. I do have a criticism in the back here though. I'm going to let you know that after I say thank you again for thinking about tie down rails halfway up. There are four of them. So you've got tie down rails at the bottom and then you've got more tie down rails halfway up. Really well thought out. What I don't like about the back here is this angle here. That angle when packing angles like that are just annoying because you want square things you want you know even a sleeping bag that is round it actually fits into a square so all these boxes are square next to each other you never want something you never want a, a, a box with an angle because how if two boxes with an angle next to each other just there's space between them they just waste space that is a waste of space it would actually have been better if that had been squared off not that you can't live with that, but it's a little bit of a noise. You see, I'm having to scrape the barrel here to find things that I don't like about this car. They're not jumping out at me. Okay, another criticism, or rather more of a question. The fact that the tie-down rails are easy to access from the side is wonderful because you don't have to climb onto the roof to tie things down. Love it. My question though, are these rubber strips, and that's a very, very heavy duty plasticized rubber, why running this way? If I've got a surfboard, it's going to rub against the roof. Surely they would have been better this way? They might have been noisy this way, but I have a question. Why are they longitudinal instead of laterally? The rock slider. There's a lot of space here. You're losing a lot of clearance. I don't think this has been particularly well done. I, I, this, A, the distance when climbing in and out of the car, the distance, it's, it's too close to the car. If it was a little bit higher and a little bit further out, it would, have this, it would, it would reduce clearance less and be far more useful. They did not muck about when they designed this car. NATO tow plug. And it's obviously watertight. Why did you do that? I mean, I'm not complaining. I promise you I'm not complaining. But what was your motivation for putting in a, a watertight cap there? I'll sort that out now. Those have got captive threads. Looks like a 12 mil and two 10, uh, four 10 mil. Why did you do that? It's beautifully finished. Double recovery points front and back and a very very I mean 
That's G-Wagon style, that is protective underneath the small fuel tank. Two things they come with uh, an option of BF Goodrich and Bridgetone tyres. BF Goodrich is, in my opinion, a far superior tyre. A uh, 17 inch rim. I want 16 inch. But if I look at the caliper clearance, I reckon, but don't quote me, that a 16 inch rim would work. They're just better than 17 off road. They just are. So could you put a bigger wheel and tire on this car, not without lifting it, is my guess. But the exciting thing about the Grenadier is that as people buy them and now owning them and now modifying them, and making them a little bit better, we will soon learn what works and what doesn't. And that is a story worth following. This here is the optional battery system that is offered by INEOS. So I'm going to let the person who knows most about it explain it. It's the first time I've actually seen one of these. So it looks like the start battery is in here. And then we've got a house battery right here, which I think is 12 volt, 105 amp hours. So there's a CTEC charging system in it. I don't think it's a DC-DC charger. I think it's just a battery connect. Just judging by the cables going to it. So you would be able to jumpstart from it. What I really like is this fuse box here. Cause it's a little fuse, fuse box. Which we would use for aftermarket fitments as well. Uh, there's great quality. And for somebody like me, I can't get to it now, but you can install extra fuses there, extra points to connect something. I really like when manufacturers think through like that. Same way they thought about extra switches on the roof. I still think that is a genius idea. Make it so much easier to install accessories into this car. I'd like to take one apart and actually have a proper look at that. Okay, Heiner. If you had one of these to do a Heiner builds your ride thing, what would you do? First of all, I'll get rid of that and I get rid of that battery and I'll replace that with a lithium battery. One that you can't jumpstart from, but you can use a jumpstart pack if you really need to. And I would uh, replace this with a Red Arc DC-DC charger that will have a solar input at the same time. And then I will have, I would have a look at if I can make better use of this area because there's still a lot of space here and also here. So this would probably also fit an inverter. And maybe you can fit a compressor somewhere in here as well. There is plenty of room even here. So I would I'll probably get rid of all the plastic make an aluminium bracket for it and then put all the equipment in here. I think you could easily fit 200 amp hours of lithium batteries in there, 40 amp DC DC charger, probably 2000 watt inverter somewhere and then you connect things to a drawer system that you would most likely put in the back so you can have a fridge, you can probably have a drop down slide for a fridge there and this will be a very nice overlanding car like that. What is wonderful though are the interior appointments. Now, the thing I, I mean, it's the nine year old loves this. Not just that. Can you hear that switch? That is a properly nice switch. They didn't buy that from J car. That's everything about it. Everything about the interior of this car. The quality, it screams quality. They haven't cut corners. And it's one of my arguments against the Grenadier is that they didn't try and build a utilitarian vehicle. Why would you do this, even begin to do this, if you were designing and developing an, a, an, a utilitarian vehicle? This is a luxury 4x4 with utilitarian underpinnings. So that's why it costs that much and to a large degree 
that is why it is so impressive it has two Achilles heels as far as I'm concerned I have said in the past that I felt that the Grenadier was too expensive certainly too expensive to fill the shoes that the Defender once fitted in comfortably however if you're trying to build a new car brand surely the best way of doing it is to produce the best you can do first to establish the quality of the brand and then offer lower priced lesser equipped options and i'm hoping that's what ineos will do with the grenadier because as nice as all of these switches and things are they're not necessary and building them into all of the grenadiers means that the grenadier is out of the financial range of so many people the question then is, would a simpler version be inexpensive enough to fit in the shoes once worn by Defender? So then, those Achilles heels that I was speaking of. The first one might seem trivial, but it's not. This lump here, I have not got used to it. I was thinking that I might, and I find it enormously frustrating. This lump I, I keep catching my foot on on it while driving and I find when driving my, my knee is constantly rubbing on here and I must pull my knee back while driving. That and the other thing is that the fuel tank is too small. 90 litres for an overland touring car is too small particularly one of this size and weight, and this engine capacity, etc. And I remember my Land Rover had a 90 litre tank and it had a 20 litre header tank that the, actually the, the, the South African, uh, they used to build them out of completely knocked down kits in Blackheath in South Africa. And they would add, add that header tank because in that market, like the Australian market, you need more range. Even that 20 litre header tank wasn't really enough. 110 is not really enough. This tank needs to be 130 litres before I would stop complaining about the size of a tank. Because there's no room underneath to fit a tank that's obvious to me. Maybe somebody will come up with a product. Let's hope they do. But so and then I have to carry jerry cans. Where am I going to carry the jerry cans? Which are potentially dangerous if they're full of petrol and certainly very smelly if they're full of diesel. Where are you going to put them? You don't want to put them on the roof. Well, not great. But where else are you going to put them? You're going to put them in the back. I would say petrol cans in the back of an enclosed vehicle. I have travelled with petrol cans and I, but I've never been comfortable with it. So what is the solution to giving this thing the kind of range that you would want in Australia or Africa? To be honest with you, in North America as well. Because my experience, even in North America, you need a thousand kilometers minimum range out of the vehicle. And I don't think you're going to get that out of this car. I think it's going to be significantly less. It's getting dark and I'm not quite finished with my review yet. And as it happened, the Grenadier hadn't finished with me yet either. A windstorm blew up and we decided that camping would be miserable. All right, I've had to turn on the, the camera because uh, we were making our way back. Uh, we can't go via the beach because the tides where we crossed earlier tides uh, would be up to those rocks so he had to go the inland route and uh, my my camera there uh, has run out of batteries and I because it's not my car I don't have a w easy way of running it while I'm driving and um, the GoPro the mount fell between the seat here and it's vanished I can't get my hand out so I have no cameras so what I uh, what I did want to do though is tell you the story I have just driven behind Heine and and this we were at a side angle of all oh, that troopy um, 76 looked like it was at the at its absolute limit it's quite wide this car and I I wasn't about to stop this, this car doesn't belong to me I, I wasn't gonna you know set up cameras and and I wanted to focus on driving 
damaging the guy's car was just not an option and I have to tell you though that if this is a consummate off-roader we some of those gnarly bits were really soft sand but a, a ridge of sand and the on that side of the car the rock was I could see it in the mirror the, my mirror has been knocked back I could see or there was six inches between the rock ledge and the roof of the car and using left foot braking I left it in high range I had such good control that I could just edge through the sand this thing is a great off-road car it's fantastic to drive off-road there's a sense of, of, of confidence one has the steering yeah is a lot of turning I'm doing a lot of turning but you know it's one of those things that I said as I said before I honestly believe that you will get used to it that was fun that was properly nice good off-road driving I'm sorry I couldn't film it it was in the heat of the moment and I'm not going to ch take chances with somebody else's car now I am not going to I'm not going to film driving I'm going to have to focus and concentrate it's now dark and I, I don't want to spend the rest of the evening uh, bogged down. We're going to have to drive this dune section carefully. There's a few more interesting obstacles. A sand dune has come through the way, so we have to drive around and over it. It would be gnarly when it's daylight. It'll be even more interesting now. But the, the way keeps going after that. But it's probably about 300 meters of that. All right. Okay. I was in the market now for a luxury four-wheel drive. Would I buy a Land Cruiser 300 or would I buy one of these? Uh, the 300 has a better ride. It is uh, every bit as luxurious and uh, on the open road better than this. But I wouldn't buy one. Firstly, I think they're very ugly and I think that Ineos is great looking. Water. <laughs> I would buy a Grenadier before I bought a, a Land Cruiser 300. You know why? Because it's just plain more interesting. I think I would have more fun with it. <laughs> and the tide is in. Before I wrap this up, I want to point out a few uh, shortcomings with the design here. This beautifully made ladder is a bit of a health hazard. Early morning, dew, there is no attempt at make the, to make this non-slip. So I would be careful with that. It's a, as I said, beautiful door and it kind of a satisfying click. But opening it, it's a bit, it's a bit, bit on the heavy side. Okay, that orifice is not particularly big to be really useful. But the worst part about this is this: where, how do I open this? I can't see the latch. The latch is in fact behind here, which means as I am trying to open it, I have to feel around for it. And if any item loaded in the back falls against this and falls against here, I might not be able to open that. That's an unfortunate location for that catch. Toyotas and Nissans, they put it here. What is the purpose of this rubber strip? I'm assuming it's a grippy area for standing on, for step, helping you step in, but it's too narrow, far too narrow. This area here, it is already, this is quite a new vehicle and it's already quite badly scratched. I imagine after a few years, this would look an absolute mess. Now having completed my review and I haven't edited it at this moment, but I thought I would come, I have to give the car back tomorrow. I thought I would come and, and it'll take me three days to edit. Do a summary of how I'm feeling right now. 
the events last night when we were it was really gnarly stuff where the performance of the vehicle was being really pushed my driving ability was being really challenged and it came up trumps it, it I wouldn't say it walked it it didn't walk it <clears throat> it the, the 76 didn't walk it it was tough and it was at night and which made it even more difficult and a bit of dune driving at night dune driving at night is really difficult you cannot see what's happening in front of the car you could drive over a sheer cliff and after that I, w I had two thoughts I had a a wow this is great but by the time I got home and I'd been in the car non-stop for three hours I had changed my mind completely and and it's because of one factor you know I can live with its shortcomings as I say all the time you learn to love the bits of your vehicle that you love and you learn to live with their shortcomings this is a shortcoming of the grenadier that I cannot live with when I got out of the car I had extreme <clears throat> lower back pain and it was because when you're sitting in this driver's seat you cannot sit straight you are sitting at an angle because of that accursed lump in the driver's footwell my foot was sore it was aching because you're either twisting it or you're lifting it up no matter what you're doing your body is not sitting straight in the seat after just three hours I was in agony yes I'm an old guy I might be seen as old in some people's eyes but if you think about the demographics the kind of people that are going to buy Grenadier well their average age is probably not far off my own it's a major design fault of an otherwise fantastic four-wheel drive so you guys in North America you are so lucky because you now have a vehicle that we don't have in Australia because in my opinion it would be extremely risky to purchase an Ineos Grenadier without a thorough test to see if that design defect would frustrate you as much as it frustrated me you can't test it by taking it around the block to see if that lump will worry you it didn't on day one it kind of did on day two and on the drive home it drove me crazy to the point where I'm glad I've had this experience I will not be buying an Ineos Grenadier until they sort that out that's me I hope that this review as honest as I have tried to make it it is honest I honestly love this car I really really do and I congratulate those people that designed and developed it you've done an outstanding job you've brought the G-Wagon which is an outstanding I'm talking 463 I'm talking the basic and you've taken the G-Wagon to the worldwide market that's actually what you've done here that fantastic vehicle that so many of us look with envious eyes on a G46 and we think you know why can't we get it in this country here it is as a four-wheel drive enthusiast I admit it I have gushed about the Grenadier it has so much likeable about it but there are some other concerns I have for other types of users for example the BMW engine it will be hard to find spares and technical support outside of highly developed countries the electronic automatic gearbox cannot be bump started and again complex and potentially difficult to repair in developing countries the rear seats don't fold flat and a very low slung fuel tank exhaust silencer track rod and drag link and of course it's a highly complex vehicle obviously competing in the luxury 4x4 market head on with the new Defender 
and I'm hoping that the second version of this will revert back to the original design brief in the Grenadier pub not very long ago. I often think about when I do reviews of cars, I know that the marketers of those cars only hear the bad things, they never hear the good things. And uh, they dwell on the bad things. But they don't dwell on the bad things in the right way. They make excuses for the bad things and very rarely do something about the bad things. I, I, I think the geometry of uh, the steering geometry on the uh, Grenadier could probably be improved with not too much effort. But they'd have to recognize a need for it before they did it and sort out that, that lump in the, in the... Surely that's not easy to sort out because they would have if it was easy to sort out. Could that alone have massive effects on sales? No question in my mind that it would have massive effect on sales worldwide. It's not a trivial thing. But I have to tell you now though, that I, I so enjoyed my time with the Grenadier. I really did. It's a great vehicle. And that's why I'm going on about it, because it could be a great four-wheel drive. It's ticking so many boxes. There's one box that, that Grenadier invented the box. A bloody great big lump in the driver footwell. Until next time, like and subscribe, obviously. And if you don't like it, well, I don't really care. See you next time.